perfect. Who better than Derek, Pat, Andrew, the wrestling crew? Man, they bout to put an end to y'all careers like a finishing move. They bout to give y'all facts on these cats that's fighting on these mats. Y'all can't see them like John Cena. Even if y'all had 2020 vision, y'all better listen. Pay attention and take notes down and realize that it's not your time now. And watch these three kings take the crown. Hey, hey. This is Gino Guts of the Taboo Crew. You're listening to Wrestling IQ 101. Now go get your shine box. Welcome back to another edition of Wrestling IQ 101. You can follow Wrestling IQ 101 on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter or WrestlingIQ101.com. I'm Andrew, alongside Pat and Derek. Yeah. Hey, what up? And today we're sitting with one half of Dirty and Durable, Simply Ravishing. Sean Donovan, how are you? I'm doing good. Who said I'm Simply Ravishing? Anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was one of the monitors. I, it was. It was for a very, very long time, but uh, I kind of bypassed that a couple of years ago. It kind of just grew out of it. So, Is it, or the genuine article? That's me nowadays. That's or, just me being as real as I can be. Or the toast of the East Coast? You know what? That was actually a part of the simply ravishing piece, but I always left it on my vest just because I love the uh, I love the the moniker. But it actually came from uh, old school wrestler that I study a lot of Hollywood John Tatum. Okay. He used to call himself the Toast of the West Coast. So I said, let me just take a piece of that and just make me a part of the East Coast. But uh, I still keep it on there. But uh, I like the moniker. But yeah, nowadays it's just uh, the genuine article. Cool. Nice. We got so much to talk about about BBWF Russell Pro IWF. Sure, yeah. everywhere you. You've been about wrestling in general, so... Sure. Let's, yeah. let's shoot the... Are we allowed to curse on this yeah, thing? Sure. Let's shoot the shit. Let's go. <laughs> so the first question mm-hmm. uh, everyone has been wondering, mm-hmm. who is Sean Donovan? Um, pretty much what you see is what you get. As, as I said, you know, the genuine article really is just a culmination of the last 16 years of me just fighting, scratching, clawing, dealing with everything there has to do with, with the sport and the business of professional wrestling, whether it's having a lot of success, having a lot of ups and downs, um, going through a lot of bullshit in wrestling. Um, you know, I've always said uh, in, in wrestling that, you know, what a lot of people see is just what they see in the ring and on TV and stuff like that. But no one truly understands unless they go through what we go through, what it, what it does to you physically, mentally, emotional, psych- emotionally, psychologically. So that's really who Sean Donovan is now is the genuine article. Um, you know, I'm just a... If you want to call him just a humble kid, you know, from New Jersey who, you know, first started watching wrestling with his grandfather, like I'm sure a lot of a lot of people did. And, you know, first match I saw watching my grandfather, um, you know, he passed away, unfortunately, you know, about two years after that. Um, I was hooked on it ever since and I never stopped. You know, a lot of people go through ups and downs where they get out of watching wrestling and get back into watching wrestling. But that was never me. It was every day, 24-7, magazines. Could not wait for Saturday to come to, to watch Superstars. Uh, I would, you know, in a mean way, growing up in a Catholic household, lie to my parents that I was sick, just so I could stay home and not go to church and watch, <laughs> and watch WCW Saturday night. I mean, it was on the case 24-7. If you didn't like wrestling, you weren't a friend of mine. That's just who Sean Donovan was. And, you know, got a chance to uh, go to a lot of independent shows back in, like, the mid to late 90s when... There were no names on shows, and they were packing 800 to 1,000 people in a gymnasium, and uh, just so happened to uh, hook up with the right people, start training, and you know, here I am 16 years later still loving this every every minute of the day. So, um, you tell me where the Dipsy Face originated from. So, the Dipsy Face was just kind of like a joke. Um, I was actually uh, hanging out at the gym. Um, of course, everybody knows the Heavenly Bodies, you know. Desirable Dustin, Jigolo Justin, they are uh, two of my best friends, uh, which I've, I've known them for over 10 years, and we were just outside the gym one day, and we just, you know, we took a selfie together, you know, and, and, and they dip, um, and, you know, Desirable Dustin, he, you know, he's the Don of Desire, so, uh, you know, he he just shouted out, he's like, oh, Dipsy, the, you know, Dipsy and the Don, you know, and I'm like, what do you mean by this? Go, oh, you know, you, you know. I'm Don, and we'll just, you know, you don't dip, so we're just going to call you Dip. <laughs> it just became Dipsy Don for a while, and then the Don just went away, and it just became Dipsy. And that was the name that just became my nickname, but the face just originated for me um, in studying wrestling, studying facial expressions, and 
studying a lot of European humor, which is very dry. You know, if yeah. anybody knows the character Mr. Bean, Rowan well, Atkinson, yeah. <laughs> um, he would make a lot of those faces, and, and my buddies would just joke around with me anytime I would see anything in wrestling that I just don't like, um, which is a lot. Um, I'm very opinionated about <laughs> certain things in wrestling. I would always make that face, and it just so happened one day... Um, We'll talk about BBWF in a little bit, but uh, it's actually the the Dipsy face piece actually came from uh, Beefcake Charlie. Mm-hmm. We're all sitting around the locker room. There was a leftover rubber chicken just hanging around. I don't know why. <laughs> you know, in a bar, <laughs> restaurant, there's a rubber chicken, but um, they they made this little video and sent me via text. You know, it's the rubber chicken that has like the O face on it, and you know they just record this little video and said, "Hey, I'm I'm Dipsy Chicken, and I don't like high spots." And, you know, the face, you know <laughs> And it just went from there, and then that's just kind of how the Dipsy face really kind of just kind of took off. And I just, hey, let's have some fun and run with this. And, you know, anyone who's in wrestling knows that anything you try to think of to come up with sometimes never works. It's the shit that you don't come up with just just pops up out of nowhere is kind of what sticks. So I just, I took it and ran with it. So that's the Dipsy face. So (laughs) So can you you kind of tell us, like, at, at what point did you decide, like, I want to be a wrestler and I'm going to do this. I don't know if I know the exact point in doing it, but it was just, it was always in my blood from watching it. Um, It's all I ever thought of doing. I mean, when I would watch the characters on TV growing up, you know, my my parents were, you know, they weren't wrestling fans, but they knew how much I loved it. And, you know, my dad was, was really awesome. You know, he would find ways to take me to events, you know, growing up in Jersey at the Meadowlands or or Madison Square Garden, or we were on vacation. If they were in town, he'd find a way to take me to, you know, to events and stuff like that. But I don't know if I can really pinpoint one example. It was just, it was something that I knew that if I didn't pursue, that I'd probably be left with a void in in my life. Mm -hmm. But I knew at a very early age, this was something I wanted to do. It was, it was everything. It's, it's the pageantry of the outfits, the entrances, the, the ability to manipulate a crowd to like you or hate you or just trying to draw any emotion out of the fans. There's just something about it that I just couldn't not do. I mean, I went went to school, went to college, and, you know, even though I had some, you know, career goals set up for myself, this was all I ever wanted to do. Yeah, it's funny, it's funny you said that because that was going to actually be one of my questions. Like, I, I when I was looking you up and I saw, like you said, like the theatrics, yeah. the pageantry, controlling the crowd and yeah. stuff like that. I thought that was interesting because I kind of like never heard anyone else ever say that before. Okay. It's kind of like, oh, it was this one match or I saw this. Yeah. And that's like a good perspective. Like, like did that kind of like, I don't know, I would say like resonate more with you than like, you know, the actual wrestling itself? Um, No, the wrestling did, you know, kind of grab my attention too. But, you know, as a kid, I was always a fan of the villains. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, but really, the only good guy I really liked growing up in wrestling was the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. And his entrance just was, like, thunderous. And yeah. the tassels, the colors, everything like that kind of just really took me in. But I, I think not necessarily a specific match, per se, but a specific group of wrestlers kind of what, what drew me in. Um, you know, I only only to when I got to the, probably the age of ten is in the area that I moved to is where I started getting NWA, WCW, yeah. and I think the two guys that really drew me into the wrestling aspect in terms of the the character and the in ring ability, more so from a character perspective, was um, Rick Rude, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, and when people ask about you know simply ravishing and me, you know. Being that that was really more of an homage to to him yeah. um, from a character perspective, the way he was able to control men and women yeah. um, really kind of got me on that on that piece there. <laughs> but the in ring aspect was was Arn Anderson, um, his promos, which I take a lot from, and his in ring ability. If there's anyone that could tell me wrestling was fake, I would say, yeah, maybe it is. But Arn Anderson's the realest fucking guy in the room. Yeah. <laughs> From his promos to his in ring, where you just believed everything he did. So yeah. I, again, I can't pinpoint one match, but those are probably some of the pieces of the puzzle that really say, I have to do this. Definitely. I have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about how Michael Blake. Mm-hmm. How did that come about, and the evolution you guys have taken to where you guys are now? So when I first started my training back in, in 2001 with, uh, with IWF, um, we had some 
partnerships with a number of other independent organizations. There was one in Pennsylvania known as IWA Pennsylvania. It was ran by uh, a local journeyman wrestler named Rapid Fire Maldonado. And I met Michael Blake. We were doing a show at his school, um, which, uh, you know, back in the day, you think of a lot of different schools. You would think that it's you know, performance center standards, and it's nothing like that. This was a school that was literally inside of a barn, second floor. Uh, and I remember the day clear as day because I remember there was no place to park. It was all dirt roads, and I literally parked alongside of a of a board that was fenced in for cows. Oh, so, <laughs> you know, and I, I walk in the door, um, and I, I remember I was teaming. Uh, with him in a in a tag match uh, that day, and we just so happened to have kind of like matching gear. And he had been training with with Rapid Fire and IWA for a while, and then he, you know, obviously meeting meeting Kevin Knight, who ran IWF at the time, uh, hooked up with him, and then he started training at IWF. And we we literally started our careers almost mirror. I think he was maybe a couple of months before me, um, but kind of just paving my way as a singles and. Kevin Knight needed a tag team, so he, he just stuck Michael Blake and I together, and we just evolved. We were just a very, at the time, you're starting out, no one really has a character, so to speak. You're kind of just you, and, you know, we kind of floundered as a mid-card babyface tag team, and uh, then, I don't, I th yeah, we, we kind of broke up, and I went singles as a heel, uh, and then at some point, he turned heel, and I had taken a break from wrestling for a little bit, um, heal up some injuries and stuff like that. And when I came back, he was already heel, so okay, let's bring us back now as heels. And that's, I think, where we really started to like find our stride and really kind of felt our way around. And we, we tagged a lot everywhere, you know, um, whether it was for the old NWA New Jersey, which was ran by uh, Dapper Johnny and Gino Moore. Um, and then again, I had to take some some time off um, due to some personal issues. And then once we got back together again, it was like steamrolling again. And then uh, this past time around, I took a really you know a decent stretch of time off um, to deal with life and stuff like that. And uh, he was kind of out of wrestling for a while once the original IWF uh, closed up and. You know, I had started doing some some shows for uh, you know for WrestlePro, uh, and he got he found that itch again. And you know, it had been probably I want to say close to ten years since he and I last teamed up. And you know, we were just at a training session one day, and and we we did a tag match, and it was like, I guess you want to call it magic, so to speak. It's just like we knew each other still like the back of our hands, and we just said it's still there. And I said, you know what, we could do singles, but I think we could do a heck of a lot more damage in terms of our abilities in the ring with younger guys and, and you know, established guys if we were to team up again. Because I've always loved tag team wrestling. You know, there's something about four guys in the ring and a manager, and if all four guys are on the same page, what you can do in a ring. So that was kind of the evolution of us. And, and obviously this time around, we're a lot more mature as, as men as that we were, you know, kids growing up in the wrestling business. We kind of know who we are and, and outside the ring, so that's how we are. It's kind of funny because the first match I saw of you, you took on the amazing Grace on the Graysons mm -hmm. and uh, Ali Rex yeah. in the corner, mm -hmm. and you just bring up the, the four people in the ring and the man yeah. like, that's so, put it all together, like, yeah. you know, watching you. Um, are you. Were you guys close in between that time? Yeah, I mean, uh, during the time I was taking time off and stuff like that, you know, we, you know, we would always make it a point to to talk all the time. You know, he obviously has his own thing going on in life. You know, he's got a family and things of that nature. So that's obviously first and foremost him. But it's not like one of those things where like we just didn't talk for years and then just started talking again. He's one of my closest friends, not just in wrestling but in life. You know, we always kept in contact with one another, and he always made sure that we were good and, and stuff like that. So there's always. There's always been that bond that's there, and I, you know, nothing but you know, absolute love and respect for him. And I think in all the years that we've known each other, I don't think we've ever had an argument. So um, we've made up disagreements, but never had an argument. But uh, yeah, he's he's a he's a wonderful <clears throat> human being. So uh, talking about your training and the younger guys, um, how would you compare when you were coming up training to how the younger guys train now, and like when you work with them, how would you compare the different styles as far as training goes? 
I think training is different on so many levels now just because of the fact that there are there's so many wrestling schools that are around and not necessarily all of them are really great to so to speak. I mean, you look at wrestling these days, anyone can go on to highspots.com and buy a ring and rent out, you know, some space and all of a sudden boom, I'm this training school. Um, I, I think when I first started there weren't as many schools around and you really had to do your research and you had to find out who are the reputable people to be trained by. And I think this day you still have to do that, but you have to weed through so much, I'll, I'll put it this way, you have to weed through a lot of garbage. Yeah. But when I first started training, it was, I think to my knowledge, there was around the Tri-State area, there was Johnny Rod School, there was IWF, there was Monster Factory, which I think at the time was still being run by Larry Sharp. And I don't, you know, there was IWA and PA, and then there was uh, Chaotic Wrestling, which was out in Massachusetts. But as close by, that was that was very local and close for me that I could get there, you know, three, four days a week. And the training was, was very different back then, too. It was, um, and I think it still is, too. Um, but, you know, you talk about a lot of, you know, old school wrestlers who went through, you know, like Ricky Steamboat, I remember, would talk about having to, you know, pick up guys in a fireman's carry position and have to climb, you know, flights of stairs. And they pretty much weeded you out of wrestling if you don't want to do it by doing all these insane cardio and endurance drills and blow up drills and things of that nature. But uh, it was the same when I started with IWF too. It was, you had to be in shape. So, you know, before starting your training, it was 200 push ups, 200 jumping jacks, 200 squats, you know, jog around the building five, six times. You know, and only then would you get in the ring at that point. Um, I think nowadays um, schools are easier. I think if you find the right school um, who does it right by reputable trainers, they're still doing it the same way, but not to that degree because they, wrestling has evolved. Um, I think most schools who do it right are doing more cardio-based endurance drills in the ring to really get your ring shape up, but... Um, I don't think there's a need to go that route and, you know, kill somebody. I know some wrestling schools still do that, and I think they should close down because of it or people should just leave because wrestling has evolved these days. You know, it's you want to be fresh in the ring. You don't want to be drained to the point where you can't even do anything properly in the ring because your body is so worn down from all those calisthenics that at the end of the day it really does nothing for you, and I think the trainers that do that are pieces of shit. They... Uh, just to be very honest, they, I, there are some schools in the Trice area that do that, and I really, I don't agree with that. Um, the goal is to learn how to do this correctly, and yes, you have to be in shape, but it's not just partly the school helping you, it's the person doing it that has to be in shape. Nah. You know, they have to be the ones to take the reins and say, if I really want to do this, I've got to get my body in the best shape possible, and what am I going to do outside of that school to do that? If they can't afford a gym membership... Hey, there's a track. You can do your own calisthenics. You can learn stuff on YouTube on what to do uh, to get in shape. But, um, you know, I'm very big proponent still, though, of in-ring training, though. Um, I mean, I'm doing this, you know, getting close to, to two decades, and I still love training. I still train at least, you know, once to twice a week uh, getting in the ring. And I like going. I don't half-ass. I go full speed. But I think for me nowadays, too, I enjoy helping the newer guys, too. Um, trying to help give them some little tips and stuff that maybe I necessarily wasn't given, you know, very early on. But um, the training aspect that you can't train enough. But it, I think again, it all comes down to finding the right school with the reputable trainers and you know making sure they have a good program set up too. If you visit a school and they don't really have a program set and you know they're just burning you out with calisthenics, you're, you're really not learning anything. Yeah. It's all about, you know, like safety in the ring. You know, you don't want guys getting hurt. In the yeah, I agree. If you, if, you, if you burn your students to have them do, you know, 300 squats, how are they going to be able to get in the ring and learn how to safely do a move when they have no legs underneath them? Yeah. You know, you could say, oh, well, we're building their ring, ring shape and their cardio and stuff like that. And that's all true to a degree, but you can also do that in the gym, too. Yeah. Um, again, the, the training should, should be fun. But it should be taken seriously too, and you kind of can't take it seriously when you have no legs or anything under you to be able to properly do, you know, a drop down or a leapfrog or something like that. You know, there's a difference between um, blow up drills and just burning somebody to the ground. It's, it doesn't get anybody anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. So um, with the uh, IWF, you uh, you accomplish a lot. Mm-hmm. Heavyweight championship, American championship, tag team championship. Uh, can you kind of just tell us about like your experiences there and IWF as a company and you know just of that nature? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, IWF is 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 where I started. Um, IWF is you know the school that gave me the opportunity to get into the into the sport of professional wrestling, and uh, I will always pay it forward there. You know, it's still a great promotion. Um, it's a great school. Um, I have nothing but respect, you know, for Kevin for giving me that opportunity. Um, I know I'm sure he talked to a number of other people, like anybody in wrestling, everyone's going to have a different opinion on someone. Um, you know, Kevin always treated me right. Um, you know, and still to this day continues to, you know, treat me right. And, you know, he and I still talk. I haven't done as many shows for them lately, um, just because I, I want to be able to really get back out there and really make a go at this one more time. And, you know, I've been afforded some opportunities by a number of other promotions that inhibit that, but um, it's still a great promotion over the years. And I'm, I've met, you know, a number of my best friends um, are from there. So that's another thing I have to thank Kevin for. If I didn't train there and wasn't there for the longest period of time, I would have met guys like the Heavenly Bodies. I would not have met, you know, Michael Blake or guys like Biggie Biggs, you know, who a lot of those guys became, you know, like Biggie Biggs is, is one of my... I consider one of my closest friends and he's a mentor to me still to this day because of the longevity that he's had and you know what he's done in wrestling and it, the training there has always been great whether it was the original school that was in west patterson or you know the new school that opened up in nutley um you know great training in terms of of the basics the fundamentals um it's very old school style wrestling um you know good crowds uh, very family friendly oriented um, but I think, you know, the, the biggest thing I, I take away from, you know, from IWF is the fact that um, nothing was handed to me there. You know, I worked very hard for all the opportunities that I got there and opportunities that I got to uh, try out for WWE. Uh, all of that was because of Kevin and IWF. Um, you know, at the time when I was doing a lot there was because I was training four days a week, you know, twice on Sundays. I was, you know, busting my hump and I truly believe that. If you work hard enough, the opportunities will come for you. Um, I'm not someone that kisses anybody's ass or, or tries to do any of that type of stuff or, you know, mm-hmm. buddy up with somebody mm-hmm. just because I'm looking for an opportunity. Um, some people do that in wrestling. I, I don't do that. That's not me. That's just mm-hmm. the way I was raised to in life. But uh, I have absolutely nothing but, you know, but respect for IWF. And I would still recommend anyone who wants to train and get into wrestling, you know, go, go. If you're close by, check them out. They're definitely a reputable school to this day. When I uh, when I hear like Kevin Knight, that mm-hmm. name, I think of a guy that's just incredible promoter. Like mm-hmm. you always hear about IWF on um, whether they're on Channel Twelve News, they'll yep. be in like the newspaper like every week. Mm-hmm. They'll I've seen them on ESPN before. Mm-hmm. They're always in everything. Mm-hmm. Like how do you compare a guy that's such a great promoter for something like Kevin Knight compared to working? With a guy like Pat Buck that's has such a great mind for the wrestling business, um, it's hard to compare the two because I think they're two unique personalities. Um, you know, with Kevin, he's a master promoter. Um, he, you know, got his start in in doing radio, so he understands the business end of having to plug your business and and obviously having to get your business out there and. Obviously, being able to make contacts with, you know, people like NBC and ESPN and, you know, Channel 12 News to promote your business is great because you have to get out there and do that. Um, You know, as far as, you know, how he goes about things, uh, again, he's very calculating. He plans directly in advance for things and he's someone that plans months in advance. So, um, you know, with Pat, um, you're talking about a guy that went through the system you know, for so many years in OBW and has literally, I, I consider Pat probably one of the, the, the best wrestlers, you know, probably in the world because he knows so many different styles. And that's just my opinion. He learned so much from, you know, working OBW and underneath that umbrella, but he also branched out and has learned other, you know, styles of wrestling. And I think when it comes to branding, you know, WrestlePro and things of that nature, the differences in his shows you can see are because of his different training styles um, where Kevin is more of an old school style based wrestling. I think with Pat and with WrestlePro, um, his branding is very different. It's eclectic. It's 
a mixture of his own homegrown guys, a mixture of guys that have been in wrestling for a long while that are journeymen like myself. Uh, and then you add in those other names, a Ryback, a Cody Rhodes, um, you know, bringing in different um, styles of guys like um, Brian Cage, you know, from Lucha Underground. Yeah. And then the way he trains his students, um, very different styles. You know, somebody like me who trains there, I'm able to now learn a lot of different styles that I never did in all the years that I've done this. And now it's how do I find a way to incorporate my old school style with some of that new school and kind of develop a newer style for myself. But then you have different guys on his roster that do different things. You know, you've got big guys like, you know, like a Craig Steele who can, you know, work like a big man. You know, you have guys like Habib, you know, who can do a lot of the high flying. And I think you mix in some of those oddball characters like a CPA who is not your traditional wrestler. He's a character that you have to react to. And then you've got, again, you've got those hardcore in your face guys like a Dan Moff and a, and a Kevin Matthews. So I think when it comes to branding WrestlePro, it, you can brand it so many different ways. Yeah. And, you know, I think the reason why WrestlePro is gaining a lot of success too um, is because of that unique style. Um, it's not your typical indie where maybe you have one or, or two names on your show. I mean, we're you know, we're, we're packing houses with guys like Ryback and Cody Rhodes and Brian Cage on the same exact show. And, you know, we're running in different venues like a Starland Ballroom that, you know, yeah. doesn't ne normally necessarily would see wrestling. So um, I, I think, you know, Pat has a very unique mind for wrestling uh, and the way he brands his business is completely different than, than Kevin Knight. So, um, and I think, you know, sky is the limit the way Russell Pro is growing right now too. So, so, Going to BBWF, mm -hmm. you actually got to take on the boss, Pat Buck. Mm -hmm. How was it like wrestling him? Um, different. Um, you know, everyone has unique styles in wrestling, and I'm I'm sort of the guy that I like to kind of just go out there and just feel the crowd, and just not <laughs> really just have anything you know put together. Um, you know, Pat is um, very precise uh in terms of how to put something you know of that style together and being able to take my strengths and incorporate it with his was a lot of fun um very easy to to, to say um pat's a guy that likes to go and i'm a guy that likes to go so if you're gonna go with pat buck you gotta be you gotta be in shape um that's the easiest way i can put it but uh i had nothing but fun and i I take everything as a learning experience, and I, I learned a lot from wrestling him just in that one match. So um, everything I always try to take from my matches is a learning experience. I'll, we're our own worst critics. You know, I'll sit back and I'll watch my matches over and over and over again. So I could have done this here, should have done this there. And then I'll take the feedback from somebody else like a Pat. You know, we talk afterwards. Like maybe we would have done this here, do a little bit differently here. Um, you know, so I really I enjoy, um, especially when I can, you know, learn from, from someone um, even from taking knowledge from somebody who may have been wrestling four years, I'll ask you, what you think of the match? Because you never know that they might throw something out there that says, eh, maybe I might not agree, but what if we took it and we did it this way? So now you learn you know, from someone else too. So uh, always got to keep your mind open in wrestling. So uh, talking about feeling the crowd mm -hmm. in that match, can you just dis explain the mm -hmm. two sugars, one Splenda chant? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am, if anyone has, you know, known me or seen, you know, in my social media, I am a coffee junkie. Um, that's just how I drink my coffee. Um, <laughs> that was the weirdest chant. <laughs> yeah. And I know Pat reacted to it as well. That was, he didn't yeah, know. that was he so didn't funny. Know. I, know I know. One, one fan shouted that out. It really is just, that's how I drink my coffee with, with two sugars and, and one Splenda. And again, it's just one of those things that kind of just comes out of nowhere where, um, and again, I don't know if this was Justin or Mark or, or it might have been Fala. Um, I think we were all just sitting around one day and they just threw, we were at a diner and they just, you know, hey, Donovan, you need this. And they, you know, they threw two sugars and one splunder. <laughs> somebody took a picture of all of us and we were at the diner and whoever put up the picture, they put the hashtag two sugars, one splunder. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to run with this. And I think I got the idea from Fala because... You know, he's such a unique character and again, one of my, one of my closest friends. And when he's at shows, 
he's got such a following. If anyone has seen his following, he has this obsession with pandas. Yeah. yeah. And people have brought him stuffed animals to events, food relating to like pandas, like it's like a brand, you know, stuff like that. So I'm like, oh, what if I can try to get people to bring me coffee to show? Yeah. Yeah. So that's where it kind of started promoting that two sugars, one Splenda. No one has actually brought me a full coffee, but somebody actually did bring me a 12 pack of Cafe Bustello uh, uh, K cups for the, the Keurig machine, which is my favorite coffee. So. It's catching on a little bit, but anytime you get free coffee, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Ever since that show, I yeah. noticed the hashtag. Yeah. I noticed the hashtag. Yeah, it's been there for a long, long time, but no, nobody really notices it. So um, it's kind of, it's just kind of more of like an inside joke type of thing that just kind of took its, took its way. So the funniest thing was he had Father on and mm -hmm. like Pat wanted him to get a panda like logo on his tights. Right. And he took it as he wanted him to dress up as a panda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a panda mask, a panda, yeah, like a panda everything. Suit. You know, I'm I'm always somebody that's I'm I'm a gear mark, so yeah. I'm I'm somebody that gets new gear every couple of months. I mean, I have boxes of, of gear that I don't wear anymore. And I was actually toying around. I'm somebody that you know I actually draw my my own gear out. I don't take my designs. I draw. I'm somebody that sits at my desk and I will just sketch and do all these type of things. And I actually showed. Uh, one of my buddies was I actually had an idea, like, you know, if you hold, like, three cards up and it kind of looks like a fan almost. Yeah. I was actually trying to design something like that that actually had, like, it was, like, two sugars and, like, one stick. Like, <laughs> two white packets and one yellow packet. Yeah. It just, it never came to fruition. Oh, but, man. I don't know. Maybe at some point you'll see the giant dipsy face on my on my butt. So, who knows? <laughs> That's cool. It's an idea. t-shirt. Yeah. a t-shirt. I might just take the face and put it, boom, right on my Did butt. Did you draw that? No, I did not. As a matter of fact, uh, someone, I had the idea of always wanting to get like some caricature work done just for um, promotional purposes. And just so happens that I, I hooked up with somebody who knew a gentleman by the name of Jay Slack, who actually writes or draws uh, characters in the back of uh, PWI. Oh, yeah. um, and oh, he hooked wow. me up with him and uh, I kind of told him my idea and... Uh, you know, he ran with it. Um, he actually did one for myself and Michael Blake, which is very unique, um, which I will display that at some point. Uh, it's probably, it'll probably be our next set of uh, uh, merchandise. But uh, the Dipsy Face one that he did is actually a three-part that I haven't released. He actually did it in storyboard form. So uh, the next part I'll probably release at some point, which will be the next shirt for me as a single, is to just kind of keep the, the idea and the merch running. So I think that's a big part of wrestling that, that uh, people don't treat properly is... Uh, is the merchandise for us. Yeah. Now, to uh, kind of go back a little bit, mm -hmm. um, with your style, when I think of, like, hills and, like, mm -hmm. independent wrestling, probably my three favorite hills, you, Nico's Ricos, and Bobby Wayward. Okay. Because you're, like, the traditional classic hill, and Bobby Wayward, everybody just hates him just because. <laughs> <laughs> and Nico's gets that reaction, too, yeah. as well. So... With your style, though, I think you're a little bit different because you're more like the old school, mm -hmm. like, I'm going to work your knee the whole match. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work your shoulder the whole match. How, do you think it's like, how do you compare like that type of style to like the newer generation of a hill and kind of like more things that they can do? Kind of like being athletic and kind of like a second part to this yeah. question as well. Mm -hmm. Being a hill as well, I feel like you're supposed to have people just hate you. Yeah. So I believe it was like Kevin Owens who said, or somebody is like, why am I going to do all these flashy moves? I'm a hill. People are supposed to hate me. I'm just supposed to beat the other guy up. Like what are kind of like your takes on that as well? Yeah. I think, you know, being a heel is exactly what it is. Uh, when, when I, you know, got a chance to really work heel and really, I think I found myself being a heel and it really, as a baby face, that was, you know, pretty good. Um, but again, as I spoke about earlier, um, I always gravitated to the heels because yeah. of the way that they can just manipulate a crowd. Uh, and I think that was just something for me, just being a natural, I don't want to say I'm a natural antagonist, but like I, <laughs> I'm a very sarcastic individual. Um, so, you know, sometimes when I say certain things, I kind of say something, just kind of see what someone's reaction is going to be, yeah. so to speak. And I, I think, you know, being a heel is, is exactly what it is. I'm not looking to you know, be a cool heel or anything like that. You know, I want to be that heel that someone legitimately wants to hate me. Yeah. You know, I want you to throw a full can of soda at me. That's <laughs> it. I want you to want to jump over the guardrail. So I will always, to me, within reason, I will push the limits as far as I really can. 
mm-hmm. um, with a crowd without getting a little too uh, out of control with it. Um, but, you know, I appreciate being put in the company of, of an Ecos and a Bobby Wayward because I think they're the, you know, they're the same types. But I think, you know, the generation of, of the style that I, I, I wrestle in is a very, is a very old school style. Yeah. Um, it's a ground and pound work a body part over. And I, you know, I'm someone that's very quick too, um, quick witted. Um, somebody throws a comment at me in the crowd. I'm, I'm pretty good with being able to get one right back yeah. at him and kind of shut him up a little bit, <laughs> yeah. but I'm also somebody that I don't have a problem kind of starting something with. And then when they react to me back, I shut them down, you know, yeah. right back again. But I, I think, the new generation of heels is is very different. Um, you know, obviously, as wrestling evolves, you know, we're in a very um, competitive market right now where that high flying style, um, high spot style, is very strong right now. Yeah. Um, and I really got a chance to see that a lot. Um, WrestleCon weekend in Florida, there was a super show going on, and there was a ten man tag that probably had every great aerial wrestler that there is in wrestling today from will osprey to ricochet to desmond xavier um and it was probably the most perfect 10-man tag i think i've ever seen that displayed athleticism um high spot strong style you name it and i think looking at it today i have to look at it as okay i do work that old style but maybe i've got to change gears a little bit maybe i have to not necessarily get flashy but i've got to incorporate a little bit more like anybody has to do to stick with the time so i I think today's generation of a heel i I think it's kind of in a gray area so to speak yeah um because everyone has different opinions of well heels have to do moves yeah i can understand that and i think there may be a time and place for that but like you said kevin owen says i'm a heel why do i I need to do moves. Yeah. You know, um, I think for me, it's, it's like any wrestler who wants to stay relevant, you have to continue to change with the times and you have to continue to update yourself. And for me, that's where studying everything I can comes in into play. And again, that's where I think training comes into play because that's where you have the ability to try different things and see what can work, what won't work. And how do you still keep it true to who you are as that, individual as that heel so if i were to come up with something that looks kind of flashy sure you can cheer all you want i'm not looking to be cheered i'm looking to beat my opponent that's what i'm trying to do so i I think you know and again i I know i've spoken to people like you know rick rogers who i know if you see his tweets he does not believe in anything high spot so (laughs) but it's okay though everyone's got their own own opinion i think that's the way wrestling has to be nowadays it's subjective it always has been so you're going to have somebody that likes, excuse me, that style. Some people that doesn't like that style, but you have to be open to say to yourself, okay, we're in a business where everything is just so subjective more than ever. How do you find the right balance to what's going to get you to be successful? Sure. Now, everything at BBWF is completely different from WrestlePro. Mm-hmm. With the Taboo crew, they come out separate from Gino Gatz. Mm-hmm. You have a singles path mm-hmm. almost. Um, you got the chance to wrestle Dan Ma. Mm -hmm. How was it like wrestling him? Because that match was awesome. It's a barricade going over the place. (laughs) Uh, It hurt, that's for sure. Um, (laughs) We wrestled another match on top of that, too. That was, yeah, and that was uh, on short notice, too. Um, I I probably would say wrestling Dan Ma was probably the best singles match I think I've had in 16 years. Um, just from everything, uh, Dan is a uh, consummate professional. I can't speak highly of him enough. He's someone that's been on my my bucket list for a long time. But he's also somebody that is as intense as they get. And if you can't match that level of intensity, don't even bother showing up to the building. Because he's, he's someone that's going to push you, is going to bring a lot out of you. And he's somebody that, again, if you want to look at him, he's not a gigantic high spot style guy he's more of an old school type guy too Mm -hmm. but he finds a way to mix a little bit of that high spot with it too and he's very hard hitting and uh same thing too there you have to be able to match that intensity and that story and if you can't um like anybody in in a match if you can't match someone's intensity you're not going anywhere uh with dan moff it's you have to have i guess the word i would use is uh you have to be in sync with someone uh, when telling a story, 
uh, if you can match that personality and you can tell that story without having to even say anything to that individual and you can really be intense, then I think it just makes for an overall better match, not just with Damoff, with anybody. If both people are in, in sync with the story, and I don't mean the moves or anything like that, it's, it's the facial expressions. It's knowing when to show a specific facial expression at a specific time. It's knowing when to have your body move at a different pace at a certain time, certain time in the match that tells fans they know what part of the story you're in. And I think I'm pretty good at doing that. I know Damoff's very good at doing it. Um, I think when you have two guys that can do that, if you just kind of take all the moves out of the way, the story is there. Uh, and if you put it all together with the moves, then you have something that is, you know, I guess you want to call it perfect. Um, that that's a match I look back and I've watched probably six, seven times already. And I've spoken to him. I, we wouldn't have changed a thing. So you don't get a chance to have very many of those. Um, but again, it speaks to, you know, there weren't as many fans in the crowd as we would have liked, but it's that old school mentality of whether there's 50 or 500 people, you still go out there and you, you give those fans everything that they paid their ticket to see. It was worth the price. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate the compliment. So. And then you've also got to work with Damian Gibbs. Mm -hmm. How was it like wrestling a guy like him? Fun. <laughs> Very easy and, and fun. He's a guy that's also, he's a great wrestler, but he's a character in himself. <laughs> so I think, you know, working with somebody like Damian Gibbs, it's, uh, again, very different style from Dan Moff. He's uh, very, um, his character is extremely egocentric. Yeah. So you really have to play to that character as opposed to wrestling him. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like a CPA. I had a chance to wrestle him and you're not wrestling CPA. You're just reacting to everything that he does. <laughs> and if you're able to put yourself out there, which I'll be very honest, a lot of wrestlers are because they take themselves too seriously. Yeah. That's where I think a lot of times people struggle wrestling characters. Yeah. They have to be able to step outside who they are and just have fun with it. I'm someone I will make a complete fool out of myself being a bumbling idiot heel if I need to be, <laughs> as long as the crowd gets the story and they yeah. and the match you know gets over. I think that's that's a big thing in wrestling that people don't understand is they take themselves too seriously. Um, a little tidbit that that uh, somebody that, that taught me something was uh, Chris Candido, uh, and he said to me one time in, in a group that we were all talking in, he said, uh, "Never take yourself seriously. Um, take what you do in the ring seriously." And I think that's a hard transition for a lot of people in wrestling. Um, past year and even sometimes nowadays in wrestling I think some people have a hard time you know separating themselves from you know their character and just being able to freely put themselves out there and, right. and go out there and just entertain yeah absolutely yeah. you know you um someone else who I consider kind of like that old school uh Eddie Kingston mm -hmm. that was your first match you had against Eddie <laughs> Kingston you guys have done your research right? <laughs> yeah. yeah Eddie Kingston was my first match in, in IWF in uh, in 2001 and um I think Eddie's a phenomenal performer yeah um yeah. I think again any uh, any success he's had I think he's earned it um to again to stay relevant in, in this sport and kind of change his path um I liked Eddie a lot. We only trained for a couple of months when I first started in, in IWF. He was there with a group of guys. Um, even uh, one of the guys who now wrestles all over uh, the you know the world, the name's Jigsaw, you know, was yeah, there at that that time too. Um, and great group of guys. Um, I wish I got a chance to work with Eddie a lot more. Um, you know, again, he. He decided uh, with some of his buddies to, to leave IWF and kind of choose their own path. And, you know, they ended up really, I think, becoming um, some of the forefathers and the reason why Chikara has become a success. Yeah. Um, and Jersey just, Alpro. And Jersey Alpro as well, yeah. I grew up watching him. So, you know, just a, a great dude in general. Um, you know, we've crossed paths here and there, but I, I absolutely have nothing but respect for him. And the fact that he's, you know, made it to the dance with, with Impact Wrestling too. Yeah. Um, is really awesome to, to watch those guys, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy to see anyone that I've ever crossed paths with, crossed paths with that has worked hard to really, you know, get an opportunity to shine. Yeah, so. now we, we talk with, you know, like a lot of guys, do 
does seeing things like that, does that kind of give you more motivation? Even though I'm probably sure you don't need any more right. motivation to get where you want to get. 100%. To do things like that influence you? And- 100% all the time. You know, I I always, you know, I am very happy for those that, that make it to the dance. And I, have a, I have a couple of friends that work for WWE right now and very happy for all their success. I don't, I don't, I know some people will always kind of look back and they'll just, oh, well, you know, why wasn't it me or why wasn't it me here? Or why did they get the opportunity? I did more and wrestled longer, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it's, uh, you have to stay positive in, in wrestling. And we all go to wrestling or any, any type of sport that you try to do or in life, we all have those ebbs and flows and, and down periods where we kind of get negative on ourselves and things of that nature. But uh, it just, it, it only motivates me even more to want to keep doing this, to say, hey, hopefully at the right point and, the, you know, being in front of the right people at the right time, that maybe my opportunity will come. I think it's just staying positive. You know, for me, it, it that's where it needs to be. If I ever get the opportunity, um, you know, I'll be very happy to know that I probably earned it. Um, as opposed to, you know, if you want to call the old wrestling phrase, right, riding someone's coattails or, or <laughs> things of, of that nature. But uh, I never, I'm never, I've never been one of those guys that saw my buddies make it and say, why not me? Yeah. It, you know, I'm, we all get those opinions in our head of why not me, but it mm-hmm. never has ever been anything, you know, malicious. If anyone, like I said, it just, it motivates me more to keep doing this. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, for me, and I'm not a spring chicken or anything like that, I think what motivates me a lot these days is being able to still go and do it with guys that are half my age that could probably and should probably run circles around me. Mm-hmm. I think that's what motivates me more is being able to still get in there and create something with someone that's half my age or my same age or even some of the guys that are older than me and still being able to go out there and kind of say in the back of our minds when you walk through the curtain say okay follow that (laughs) that type of mentality that's what drives me it's it's the thrill of the competition and what can we put together that will give the fans you know a really exciting match right so um talk about making it to the show i have a little visual aid here Mm -hmm. this is your Commercial. You had a lot of you had a lot of FaceTime in this too. Yes. So I just the, want you to uh, walk me through a lot of this as it, uh-huh. as we play through it. Sure. I'm just gonna. Well, <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen this video comes in a while. Through, right? yep. door right here. That's me in the background, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Assistant Coach. Oh, this gentleman it, that, right here. There's Darren Young. There's uh, Kevin Knight. <laughs> and then uh, I don't know where his picture, but Kevin's in there. Brandon Young. There he is again. There is me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, here comes a whole, a whole slew, slew of superstars. guys. My God, this Those was a bad team this was face. a fun day. It was an absolute fun there day. There goes Darren Young. <laughs> yep. And, oh, the chair the face right at the end. and that's uh, actually Roman Zachary and uh, oh, right. uh, doing taking the uh, uh, the ankle lock uh, oh, and then man. Vince himself. So that that was a that was a fun day uh, filming something like that. Um, you know, I don't know how that opportunity came about. I know at the time, Doctor Tom Pritchard, who um, I will put over to anybody who has really been. A mentor to me in a lot of different different ways. I've known him and done a lot of his camps over the years. And when he was the head of talent relations for WWE back in the early 2000s, and he was coming to a lot of schools, including IWF, I assume that's where the kind of the hookup came to um, to do that. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. And you know, a couple funny stories from from that day of filming was. Uh, I didn't want to be the assistant coach. <laughs> I wanted to be one of the football players getting my ass handed to me. But again, being so young, not realizing till years later, wow, I had the most FaceTime. Yeah, they saw your face. Hey, yeah, like, yeah, every scene. Looking back on it now, it's like, okay, now I, I'm, I'm happy I was the, the assistant coach. But I actually, in the first part of filming, I actually was uh, one of the football players. And you don't see it very, you can kind of see it up close where Benoit is putting the, uh, we won't say that name, <laughs> um, where he's putting the, uh, the cross face on. You kind of see a little bit of somebody hitting the ground for a split second there. Yeah. And the way that scene was designed was um, Cena was giving me FUs. Okay. Um, it's not fun to take about 10 or 12 FUs in full football gear on actual you know, <laughs> ground like right. that and then to know that it wasn't even used. And then I had to basically they, the, the guy who was supposed to show up to be the assistant coach never showed. They looked at a bunch of guys. They thought 
for my, you know, the way I look that I probably fit that bill. So, uh, I got, guess I got to do double the work, even though one of them wasn't, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, put in, involved with that. But, uh, you talk about a, a fun day of getting to just, you know, meet a lot of these guys and just, you know, have some conversation. It was very, very humbling to be chosen to have an opportunity like that. And the fun part about, I think the second part I think is kind of fun about that was, uh, about a month or so afterwards, because this, I think, was shot back in the summertime. So, like, a month or two later, I am at, um, I think it was the second or third time I'd ever been, uh, I had done extra work for WWE. And there was, they always had a number of chairs set up in the back with a monitor for all the, all the wrestlers to watch. And I'm kind of just sitting there, just, you know, kind of by myself. And, you know, Bubba Ray and Devon are kind of just sitting right next to me and a bunch of other guys. And, you know, as they're watching it live, you know, the commercial plays and I just, I just feel like all of a sudden a number of people are kind of just looking at me <laughs> and looking back at the TV and then looking at me again and trying to say, is that the same guy? <laughs> and I, I think I remember at one point, um, Devon kind of looked at me and I just went, <laughs> I shook my head I'm like, yep, that's me. And I just continued watching and he just kind of smiled and. Not because he was there that day too, and just maybe didn't remember. But I, it was just kind of funny. Uh, it was a little, little funny joke. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I call it that. It's just imagine all these guys who who are on a roster where you want to be, and they're just kind of staring at me like, Did I "Do something wrong, <laughs> yeah, right?" <laughs> so uh, Darren Young was in the video. Mm-hmm. Now I had heard you were the one that brought him into wrestling. Who do you hear this from? I got hey you got my sources, sources yeah. oh, please tell me the sources I want to see if they're true or not <laughs> you tell me yeah. um, to a degree yes um, I worked at a um, a local gym in the area um, and um, you know Darren Young was I, I remember um, if I tell it right so this was 2001 or it was 2002 um, it was Thanksgiving day. So again, it's a local gym. They weren't open, but I had the keys cause I would open and close the gym. So I went in for a workout and a buddy of mine who's still a close friend to this day, um, was one of the trainers there. And, uh, he was a, his, I believe his brother-in-law employed, um, Fred Darren Young, um, uh, at a local place where he was working at. And, uh, they should all showed up at the gym, and at that point, you know, Fred is you know just a, a brick shit house, like just thick. Um, and he's like, "Oh, I love wrestling and stuff like that." And I, you know, I said, "Hey, you know, um, we were with IW at the time," and I said, "You know, hey, we're we're doing a show in, I believe it was Edison." I said, "Why don't you come check out the show? Um, and if you like it, let me know. I'll, I'll get you in touch with, with Kevin." Um, he came, he checked out the show, really enjoyed it. Um, Michael Blake and I were tagging at the time. So, uh, yeah, after that, I put him in contact with Kevin. He came over, he checked out the school, um, he joined, and the rest is history. He, you know, he's someone that, again, busted his ass and deserves every bit of the success that he's had. He, he started like a house of fire, and you could tell he was just a natural. I mean, he he picked up training very quickly, even faster than I did when I first started a couple of years prior. But you know, he was someone that again trained four days a week, busted his butt in the gym, um, did everything he needed to do to get in front of the right people um, over the years. And you know, when the time was right, you know, he got that opportunity and got signed. And again, all his hard work got him to where he is right now. So uh, nothing but love and and respect for him too. So, you know, I may have helped get his foot in the door, but he's the guy that, you know, I would say for lack of a better term, knocked the door down. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's a tremendous individual. Yeah. WWE, you know, tag team champ all these years later. Yeah. And, you know, he he does a lot of work with, with be a star. And, um, you know, I could not be happier for his success. If there's anybody that deserves success, it's him. Because I know a lot of the the struggles he's gone through. I've seen, um, some of the struggles he's went through. So for him to be able to bounce out of all that and you know do what he's doing now is, is a credit to the type of person that he is. 
place. Now, now being, you know, in wrestling going, you said almost on two decades now. Yeah. Um, yeah no. When you like look at new talent, is there anybody you see that you just like, there's like great new talent that's just wrestling right now? Um, a, a lot. I mean, I was just at a, at, a, at a Ring of Honor camp very recently and I saw a lot of guys that I've never heard of or seen before. Um, that have actually been wrestling for, you know, a pretty decent time. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Wrecking Ball Ligurski who works in the Connecticut area, Northeast Wrestling. Giant, giant guy. Um, just a great big man. I think he's got a lot of upside to him. Another gentleman I got a chance to work with at the camp who works in a lot of the New England area um, named Josh Briggs. Yeah. About six foot seven. Uh, another guy that that's just picked it up fast. Um... Maxwell Jacob Feinstein, I think, will be a star in this in this business. I, I like the dude a lot. He's a really, really cool guy. Got a chance to you know be friends with him. I know some people get his personality, some people don't. Uh, if there's anyone who's a legit heel in real life, uh, it's, it's it's Maxwell Jacob Feinstein. Um, he's got a lot of upside. Uh, we talk about like high flying in the spot style wrestling. A guy like um, Flip Gordon is awesome too. Um, there's there's so much talent out there now. It's it's almost scary yeah. because ten years ago there wasn't this much talent in wrestling, yeah. and now it's just coming out of the woodwork. Even the younger guys that are that are at WrestlePro, like I, I'm a huge fan of of Team Espana when it comes to tag teams. I think mm-hmm. they're great characters. Um, all all the guys I can't say enough about at WrestlePro just because I'm there with them all the time and I see how hard all of them work. Nikos Rico is another one of those yeah. guys who's you know, I think has got a lot of upside, but there's there's so many that are probably on my mind. I probably forget to name them all, but there, there's so many guys out wrestling now. To me, it's it's scary, but it almost makes my bucket list full because yeah. I want to work all these guys. <laughs> um, you know, I've said that I've said I've even put up as a as a Twitter post one time. I said, when is someone who gets going to get smart and book me versus Maxwell Jacob Feinstein? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's just so much talent out there now. It's hard to even pinpoint just one, but those are some of the guys that really just come to mind. Another guy that I actually, I will say is, um, Mark house is another one. Um, him and, and colossal Mike law work as a tag team called the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and both of those guys, whether they're singles or in tag team, they're awesome together too. So I can't not, can't not mention those guys. So I love the Maxwell house. Yeah, fun, fun <laughs> one night only type thing. I think is what it was, but uh, and, uh, yeah, they're they're both great. And that, he he came out to the ring. Um, Maxwell Jacob Feinstein at uh, House of Hardcore you know, that when I was when mm-hmm. I was uh, when I was there, and man, they were like booing the scarf or ripping on him, and oh, he yeah. just he just gives it right back. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I talk about a guy <laughs> who's working everywhere. Like he is everywhere every weekend. That that's amazing to see. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you know promoters are. You know, giving guys a chance to really shine and, and do their thing, and you know, again, like you said, what a better what a better house to um, you know do that in than House of Hardcore with, with Tommy Dreamer. So. <laughs> so, is the Nickelodeon thing true? What do you mean? Like you guys, uh, you had a promo on WrestlePro, and you guys said that you did like you had something in the works with Nickelodeon. Yeah. So uh, back in the day, um, Kevin Knight, who you know ran IWF. Um, always, again, smart businessman, outfitted his school to multiple other things. Um, and it just so happened that Nickelodeon, who was in the city, was looking for a building to shoot a pilot called Nickelodeon Whack. So they had first come to IWF, and they selected a bunch of us, and we were dressed up in these wacky costumes. It was like a <laughs> wrestling theme with aliens and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> But they, they, they had filmed some pilot work there, and then they invited us to a, a number of the same guys to do it again. They were doing it at some, it was at like, at some like boxing gym in, in New York. It wasn't, you know, Johnny Rods or anything, but it was somewhere in Brooklyn, I don't remember. And then after that, the pilot was kind of taking on a life of its own to where they actually rented out a studio in the same building that Martha Stewart ran her show. Sure. Um, and it was full lights. I mean, it was gorgeous. Um, the best thing I remember that day was the catering was phenomenal. <laughs> um, but yeah, they we, same thing again. And that pilot was in the works. And um, 
by the time anybody found out anything about it, uh, I guess the word came down that it was too violent for Nickelodeon. Oh, uh, man. Which, looking back on I don't know how it was. I mean, it was, there was a, I was dressed up as a female alien, and my <laughs> one spot in that pilot for all those hours were there was nailing one of the other um, uh, aliens with a purse. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> So, again, I don't know if it was specifically the time slot they were looking to air that they considered it too violent. You know, if it was a time like when, you know, little kids would be watching as opposed to like Nick at Night or something like that. But for whatever reason, um, after those three pilots, it just, it never, it never got picked up by Nickelodeon. So, um, but, you know, a lot of opportunities, thanks to the actual sport of wrestling that, you know, I've been given to do some different things, you know, acting and stuff like that to kind of branch off. So, um, you never know where this crazy yeah. business is going to take you. You never know when someone's going to be watching or yeah. or show up at an event, and you never know who you're going to meet. So that's, true. that's wrestling for you. Yeah, you think about like yeah. Ren and Stimpy or like yeah. all the things that they yeah, have right? on. And if you look yeah. at the yeah. tones of Ren and Stimpy. I know, yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Some crazy stuff. Yeah. So I mean, it just comes down to who who's who's watching that pilot or what's taking it. Yeah. Yeah. Like. It, it's the same thing with wrestling, right? You get a tryout with WWE, you know, you might have three coaches that like you and one person that just really doesn't, and they may be someone who's more in a position of power, and that may not yeah. be the right the right time or place for you. So you never know. It's anything in life. That's right true. place, right time, uh, right people. Nice. So I'll ask my, uh, my final question. Mm-hmm. Um, for anyone that's getting in, you've been doing this a long time, mm-hmm. what's the best advice that you can give them? Um, be in shape mm-hmm. you gotta be in shape don't wait till you start at a school to get in shape um, because you'll get weeded out very quickly um, and I don't mean that in a negative way but your body won't be able to handle it so I think you gotta be in shape is number one uh, number two um, be humble and respectful I've seen a lot of guys start in wrestling they've come and gone within you know minutes because they just did not have the right attitude um you kind of have to it's okay to still be a fan but you kind of have to drop that a little bit and and know the world that you're entering into um i I think not just that it's um it's do your homework and i what i mean by that is i've watched wrestling my whole life i kind of get how certain things are done to a degree like running the ropes you kind of see how guys run the ropes. So yeah. kind of do your homework and study a little bit because you know you're going to be learning this. So I almost kind of take it as, look as if you're going to interview for a job. Yeah. You know, do your research on the company you're interviewing for. Um, um, but And then don't be afraid to try new things. I see a lot of that in schools where newer guys um they will only tend to get in the ring with newer guys they're very afraid to get in the ring with someone that's experienced because they think that they're going to screw up or get hurt or hurt that individual there's a reason why why you want to get in the ring with experienced guys because they're going to help and teach you so don't be afraid to get in the ring with newer guys i think if, if people kind of take on some of the that mentality um you know you can be successful but also realize why you want to do this. You know, I know sometimes people, they, they start out in wrestling and they take that first bump and then they realize that it's not for them. Take a chance on yourself. Don't, you know, don't say, oh, I wish I could have, could have you know, been a wrestler. Yeah. Just go for it. You know? yeah. go, and then uh, the last piece is make sure you find a reputable school. You know, make sure you, you do some research on the people who are the head trainers of that school who run the promotion and, See what they've done in wrestling. You know, um, if you are looking up a school that has no notoriety and just because the price on the tuition looks good doesn't mean <laughs> it's the right place. I would. It's like anything. Uh, like it's like for me. I said to me the other day, I want to get a tattoo done. I said I'm more than willing to pay the price for it as long as the quality of work is there. I think it's the same thing with wrestling. Don't not join a school just because it might be quote unquote too expensive. I'm sure they may have a tuition fund or things of that nature, but Find the people that have done something in wrestling and, and go and visit the school and see their structure. And if you think you can handle it, make sure you're in shape, show up, put your gear on, and sky's the limit if you really want to put the uh, the effort in, into it. Whether you want to just do it as a hobby or you want to make a career out of it. So, nice. yeah. And age can't be a factor either. You know, 
I always put that in my hashtags. Age ain't shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's true. You, I've seen guys start training at the age of 45 and 50. Oh, so wow. there's there's no limit on age. So yeah. if you want to do it, go for it. Nice. That's good. good. So uh, I need you to also decide this age-old debate. <laughs> Is it Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks? <laughs> Um, for me, it is Dunkin' Donuts. I know a lot of people don't. They think it's dirty dishwater. (laughs) I think Starbucks to me is way overpriced and too strong. Um, if you mix it with the right type of, uh, creamer and sugar, it tastes good. Um, you know, these days, uh, Actually, to debate that, I probably would actually say Wawa at this point. Oh, Wawa, well, yeah. uh, I think I have found the right blend <laughs> on how to make my coffee. So um, it's still Dunkin' Donuts to me because I, I, you know, the area that I live in, there's there's no Wawas around. So uh, until oh, a Wawa comes here, I'm still a Dunkin' Donuts guy. But I think uh, my heart is starting to lean towards Wawa. Now. So in the matter of coffee, you do not get what you pay for, <laughs> unlike tattoos and wrestling. Right? Correct. All right. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing. I've had a unicorn frappuccino from Starbucks. Okay. And it's probably top five best, <laughs> best things I've ever had in my life. So, I saw people walking around saying. with those things. I've never had a unicorn frappuccino. I, mean, I will more than happily have Starbucks as long as somebody else is paying for it. I can't pay four or five dollars for a large coffee or whatever they call it. It's a, a vente grande, grande or whatever. Or High price bullshit. <laughs> Just give me a large coffee. Right? Take it. That's the way I feel. It's funny, man. It's funny. The best is when you go through a drive thru and you get the people. And again, I'm not, not being mean here, but when you go through a drive thru and you get that person on the other end that just speaks very little English uh-huh. and you're trying to get across, I want a large coffee with two sugars and one Splenda. And they're like, huh? <laughs> It's too long for them. They're yeah, just usually hearing, yeah. I want a, I want a large coffee black or I want a large coffee just cream. And you kind of spew that out there. It's like, now I'm kind of being like a, uh, like a diva with my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you've gotten the face of the Apple Core, mm-hmm. uh, Heavenly Bodies, the team of Sanjay Dutt, Fala. Mm-hmm. Who are some of the people that take a bucket list dream match? If somebody in WWE, past, present, or future that you want to, you want to take on a tag team match? Wow. Um, that would actually, could actually happen or just in general? Just in general. Like, um, like the Road Warriors or the Dudley Boys? I think, you know, you know, to me in a tag match, uh, it would have to be, uh, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Oh, okay. Oli and Arn Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. I love the style with Tully, who brought a little bit more of a flash to that, but yeah. I think just straight up, just beat the holy hell out of you and tell a really good story yeah. um, to me would have been, you know, if I had the opportunity to wrestle Oli and Arn would be uh, out of this world. Nice. That would be awesome. And for us, this is wrestling like, oh, cool. <laughs> I was about to say, you know him before me? <laughs> Let me put myself on. Yeah, man, what's going on, man? <laughs> Got him <a> promote where, stuff. <laughs> so where can people find you on social media and upcoming events if you have? Sure. Uh, anyone can find me. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, the, the handle is at Sean Donovan zero one. Uh, hopefully I will get on Snapchat, uh, at some point I keep putting it off, but every <laughs> thing I need to have a filter with bunny ears, and, uh, <laughs> weird stuff, but, uh, you can find me on those three handles for now. Um, upcoming events, uh, you know, again, you can still find me at events with, uh, you know, BBWF, um, wrestle pro. Um, venturing into some other areas in Delaware and Massachusetts soon. Um, the most recent event you can find me at is uh, June 10th for WrestlePro uh, in Keyport, New Jersey. Uh, if you're still looking to find out where it's at, you can go to WrestleProOnline.com or check out WrestlePro's uh, Facebook or Instagram pages for uh, more info. But uh, you'll see me expanding to a lot more places very, very shortly. Nice. If we're talking about one of those good wrestling schools, Creator Pro is... It's definitely a good wrestling school for any starters to get yes, started at. One hundred percent. Pat Buck and Kevin Matthews and Mario Bacara and, and Dan Moff are all all great guys to learn from at the school, and it's a great and fun atmosphere. So, if you're looking for a great wrestling school within that, uh, you know, middle to northern New Jersey area, um, you know, check them out. And again, you can also check out uh, IWF as well. They've got a great program at nice. their school too. Nice. And for us, you can follow us at Wrestling IQ 101. 
That's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, WrestlingIQ101.com. You can listen to this interview, all of our other interviews, all of our great interviews. And we are out.